हेलो एवरी वन टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद अ न्यू टॉपिक दैट इज एफ टी टी एक्स नेटवर्क नाउ वी स्टार्ट विद इंट्रोडक्शन टू एफ टी टी एक्स फर्स्ट टॉपिक इज फिजिकल टेक्नोलॉजीज फॉर कम्युनिकेशन द ट्विस्टेड पेयर कॉपर वायर इज द ओल्डेस्ट एंड स्टिल वाइडली यूज डिप्लॉय टेक्नोलॉजी दैट स्पोर्ट्स अ सिंगल एनालॉग टेलीफोन लाइन टू द होम डिजिटल सब्सक्राइबर लाइन टेक्नोलॉजी इज यूज टू ट्रांसपोर्ट डिजिटल डेटा The TV signals are brought into homes by using coaxial cable from a master antenna which are called community antenna television systems. But nowadays there is an evolution of the technology from coaxial cable emanating from the central receive point to hybrid fiber coax systems in which the signal is taken by the fiber optic cable from the head end or hub to a node. the low signal loss compared to that of coax is the advantage of fiber hence the signal is transmitted to larger distances without amplifying it therefore this technology provides better reliability better quality and lower operational expenses hfc extension to the smallest node that serves only one home brings the third technology called fiber to the home only passive components are used to the to build fttl systems that improves reliability and no need to make provision to obtain power from commercial resources and no need of backup power as a result there is reduction in both capital and operational expenses and enhancement in the reliability and quality of the received signals next is terminology in telephone background a central office is the point where signals are assembled to go to the subscribers and is called head end in a cable tv background a digital subscriber line access multiplexer or a hub is a field mounted terminal where signal formats are converted and sent to a home from the last distance a high level hfc system is illustrated in this figure A primary head end gathers most or all TV content and may be the interface point for data and voice services. An optional secondary head end which mirrors the functions of the primary head end may be placed in a geographically different part of the metropolitan area so that if a disaster such as fire occurs at the primary head end the secondary head end can take over. The head ends are linked using fiber optic cables to hubs which may serve 10000 to 20000 customers the hub may include certain data and may be voice equipment and will typically convert signals to the rf modulated format needed on the coaxial cable the rf signals are in turn modulated onto optical carriers in optical transmitters the output of these transmitters differs from that which you may have experience with for transmitting data rather than transmitting a digital signal represented by light on for a binary 1 and off for a binary 0 or vice versa the optical transmitter is a linear analog transmitter capable of transmitting a wide spectrum of rf signals each signal carrying one of several types of content one 6 megahertz channel may carry one analog video signal or multiple digital tv signals or time division multiplex data including voice These signals are assigned a frequency band and many such signals can coexist at one time on one fiber optic transmitter. The optical transmitter puts signals onto a fiber optic cable which traverses most of the distance to a neighborhood to be served. At the neighborhood a node demodulates the optical signal turning it back into the RF modulated carriers which went into the optical transmitter. From here The signals are transported to homes through coaxial cable. RF amplifiers are usually needed to overcome signal loss. Each time a tap is used to remove some signal power to serve one or more homes, conservation of energy dictates that less power is available to go further downstream to other homes. The second mechanism is loss in the coaxial cable itself. If the signal level gets too low, then analog channels get noisy. If the digital signal gets too low in amplitude the data disappears with just a small signal level range where the data breaks up upstream signals are all rf modulated carriers returned over the coax by using lower frequencies on the coax at the node 
they are modulated onto an optical carrier by an upstream transmitter and then transmitted to the hub usually on a dedicated fiber but sometimes on the same fiber used for downstream but on a different wavelength next is common ftth systems a passive optical network is the common type of ftth system to which hfc network may be contrasted the pawn starts at the hub and 32 homes are served by it 64 homes are served by some systems the hub is illustrated in the given figure a number of pawns are served by this hub a single fiber strand defines each pawn that feeds a passive optical splitter 32 homes are served by each splitter with some serving 64 homes the optical network terminal is an interface on the home which is also known as the optical network unit the optical signals are received by the ont and then converted to the electrical signals ethernet for data is the most basic electrical signal and one or more ethernet ports are contained in the ont for plain old telephone services analog voice ports are there and one or more rf ports for video are also included the pawn uses several wavelengths to transport optical signals for downstream data 1490 nanometer and 1577 nanometer are used for gpon and xgpon systems respectively for upstream data 1310 nanometer or 1290 nanometer for 10 gbps links are used a 1550 nanometer optical carrier is used to broadcast videos the data signals are handled by the equipment called an optical line terminal next is other ftth physical architectures the physical layer architecture is used by most systems whereas some use a point to point architecture where fiber is run directly from the hub to each subscriber for downstream and upstream communications on different wavelengths single fiber is used The advantage of P2P is that the data pipes are not shared by the users due to which each user can have more bandwidth. But the concentration of data at the switch is in the hub can negate this perceived advantage. The low cost ONUs are used by P2P networks. The need for more fiber and higher fiber splicing costs are the offsetting factors that lower the ONU cost. The FTTH systems are summarized in the given figure. When we consider what we usually think of as FTTH systems, means binary data downstream and upstream on the same fiber, optionally combined with broadcast, there are two chains of standards to follow. The earliest was the ITU's APON, that is ATM over PON system, specified in the 1990s. It established the general architectural elements of subsequent systems and was deployed a little experimentally but we know of no current systems in use it was based on atm that is asynchronous transfer mode a layer 2 protocol essentially competing with ethernet a protocol used and still in use extensively in the telephone industry among others there was no provision for broadcast video and at the time ip tv was not really feasible APON was modified to free the 1550 nanometer wavelength for a broadcast video overlay by putting the downstream data at 1490 nanometer. This produced the BPON standard which offered a maximum downstream speed of 622 Mbps and an upstream speed of 155 Mbps and which has been deployed rather widely in much of Verizon's FIOS network along with other installations. operators perceived the need for higher speeds and ethernet was becoming the apparent winner of the layer 2 race so the itu ratified the g.984g pon standard in 2004 it started with b pon increased the maximum downstream speed to 2.488 gbps and the upstream to 1.2 gbps and added ethernet and tdm transport to the atm transport already in the standard adding these additional layer 2 transport standards though made implementation of the standard extremely complex and as a consequence not much happened commercially for a year or two then people realized that they really did not need all of these transport standards 
Ethernet, which began as an enterprise standard for corporate data networking, had improved in many respects and costs were dropping precipitously. So the Ethernet portion of GPON was built into chipsets, effectively abandoning the other parts. This made a commercially viable product possible and since then, a number of operators, many with telephone backgrounds, have deployed GPON. Meanwhile, the 802.3 subcommittee of the IEEE, which was responsible for the Ethernet standard, had been adding its own version of FTTH to the Ethernet standard. The task force charged with developing the original standard was formerly known as 802.3AH and at times, the standard was ratified in 2004 and the next time the 802.3 Ethernet standard was updated, the 802.3 AH work was incorporated into it. Typical of IEEE Ethernet work, the EPON standard specified only the minimum items necessary to implement the PON standard. Things such as detailed management protocols and encryption, which were built in the GPON standard, were not incorporated into EPON. Rather, it was left to commercial interest to adopt existing specifications to fill in these gaps. This means that EPON standard was much easier to implement than was the GPON standard. So by the middle of the decade, chipsets for EPON became available and some manufacturers who had previously produced similar proprietary PON systems switched to EPON. EPON gained quite a toehold in Asia which was hungry for improved telecommunications. It also gained adherent in the Americas and Europe, though many early adopters in these areas waited for GPON. EPON has been known by several other terms, including GEPON, that is Gigabit Ethernet PON, and EFM, Ethernet in the first mile. Besides the PON standard, 802.3 AH defined P2P Ethernet to the home, either on fiber or twisted pair. A while after 802.3 AH was ratified, several other related activities sprung up. A working group was formed under the 802.3 AV name to consider increasing the speed to 10 Gbps. This group has subsequently finished its work and 10 Gbps EPON has been incorporated into the 802.3 Ethernet standard. Another group SIEPON was formed to fill in some of the missing pieces of the EPON standard in order to make it more robust for commercial applications. These missing pieces were built partially on the work of the Metro Ethernet Forum, which was formed from the old DSL Forum to promote Ethernet as more than an enterprise solution by adding features to give Ethernet some ATM-like capabilities at a much lower cost. The cable television industry in the US became interested in EPON as a way to compete with telephone companies installing GPON and as the next architecture beyond the tried and true HFC. Some in the industry were concerned though about certain basic management philosophies and techniques that had gone into EPON which were in conflict with the management of DOCSIS cable modem systems which had captured the greatest part of the residential data business. Large cable operators had developed very complete management systems around the DOCSIS system and they perceived that adopting EPON to use these management systems would make it easier to incrementally add EPON to their HFC systems. It is impossible, both physically and financially, to change out HFC systems for FTTH systems overnight. So the concept was to build new plant, possibly in green fields and into business regions where cable was starting to penetrate with FTTH while continuing to operate existing HFC plant for a number of years. Accordingly, cable television laboratories initiated the DOCSIS provisioning of EPON work, which as of this writing has produced two revisions defining how to adapt EPON to be managed by existing DOCSIS management systems. Yet more activities were underway. Another perception of how to move HFC to FTTH was to build physical networks according to FTTH concepts. But to retain the existing DOCSIS infrastructure at the end. The Society of Cable Telecommunications Engineers undertook this standardization effort. Rather than terminate the network with OLTs of the hub, 
and conventional ONTs at the home, the network would be terminated at the head end with equipment identical to that used in HFC systems with the possible exception that HFC uses a lot of 1310 nanometer downstream transmission and in all FTTH systems this wavelength is reserved for upstream transmission. Downstream transmission would be on 1550 nanometer. Two options were specified for the upstream wavelength that is 1310 nanometer for people who wanted the most economical equipment and were not accept, expecting to put pawn data on the same fiber. The other option was for upstream transmission at 1610 nanometer which would let the fiber network also accept pawn transmissions. The first standard was ratified through SCTE then through ANSI which is the top level standards organization in United States. This ratification was completed in 2010. Not on the chart, there is yet another effort currently under consideration by IEEE which is intended to allow cable operators to adapt their existing HFC plant to pawn gradually by replacing nodes with the new device which would convert the pawn optical signals to electrical format for transmission to the home on existing coax. This effort is known as ePON protocol over coax that is EPOC. In turn, it is planning to use the physical layer of another cable labs initiative DOCSIS 3.1 an ambitious effort to provide much much higher bandwidth over HFC networks by expanding the RF bandwidth used by DOCSIS by using more efficient modulation methods so this is all in this lecture thanks